You are listening to Open Democracy. Hello and welcome to the Open Democracy Show. I am James and today's episode is a condensed version of the live discussion we held last week called Why Do Russians Support the War? So it's been over one year since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine began and surveys show that over two-thirds of Russians still support the war. So why do people believe that this special military operation is necessary? And how is it possible that they're still not changing their minds even when they know that the Russian army is committing war crimes and that the war's prolonged duration is having huge economic impacts on everyday citizens? Well, that's what our panel is aiming to answer in this episode. If you'd like to watch the full debate, you can do so over on our YouTube channel. Okay, that's enough of me. I'm going to pass over now to Polina, who is chairing this debate. Hello, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Open Democracy's live discussion on why do Russians support the war? My name is Polina Aronson, and I'm an editor at the Russian language section of Open Democracy, and I'm very happy to welcome all of you today together with our wonderful panelists, Yelena Konyova and Oleg Zhuravlev. Um, so the title of today's discussion may sound quite provocative to you, because since Russia's full-scale scale invasion of into Ukraine, many European politicians and public figures insisted that this is Putin's war and not Russian's war. And this popular trope suggests that regular citizens do not support Kremlin's politics and that the virtual absence of open protest may be explained only by people's fear of prosecution and imprisonment. And yet there might be some wishful thinking involved in this reasoning. As Jade McGlynn, an expert on Russian politics, suggests in her latest book, Russia's War, the war with Ukraine could not be fought without support of the Russian people. What does support actually mean? And what role does propaganda play in feeding it? Since the beginning of the war, Open Democracy has tried answering these questions in our publications. We have spoken to media experts and sociologists. We have reported from Russia's poor regions and from capital cities. We have turned from for expertise to the few remaining independent local deputies to find answers. And unfortunately, what we found wasn't exactly great news. Indeed, very few people would agree that they actually outwardly support murders of civilians and destruction of whole cities. Most, however, would find explanations for why in this particular situation, the so-called special military operation was, in their opinion, the lesser of all evils. And today we will try to find explanations to the seeming paradox together with our experts, Helena Konyeva, founder and researcher at the international research and analytical company Extreme Scan, and Alek Zhuravlev, researcher with Public Sociology Lab, an independent hub conducting qualitative social research. So, Alek, Helena, my first question to you. Um, what was the moment when you realized that support for the war is, in fact, quite widespread, if not massive, and definitely larger than you might have expected? And how did it make you feel? Since the week the war started, when we finish our first opinion poll, and uh, we find out that support is, is, is really high, it was 58%. And the beginning of the war was insane, it's clear, but, but uh, the level of support seems impossible. You see, we, we, I, would never, I would never believe that we could get to this figures. I can understand why uh, people could support uh, Putin or governor or, or accept without protest um, in, injustice or uh, cruelty or, or lies in the country. But it, it's very hard to, um, to understand how people can s support the war, which is the worst what could happen in people's life. And, and for me, it was a very... Uh, painful and uh, and uh, and motivating question. So I decided it would be my personal goal to understand the reasons for that support, the, the nature for this support, and to find a narrative to do all the best to decrease it. So, of course, there was a shocking feeling, but on the other side, I would say it was inspiring for me because I, I guess that it would be my, my business for the rest of my life. Uh, I just uh, want to explain very briefly that uh, whereas Yelena's company is conducting um, uh, actually opinion service and telephone uh, telephone service and doing uh, polls on uh, large samples of population. Oleg and his team are working uh, with qualitative methods, working with 
um, smaller samples uh, by in-depth uh, interview methods. So uh, the impressions from the field also vary because of the um, method differences. Please, Alia, go ahead. Yeah, so um, the first uh, opinion poll numbers uh, appeared very soon after the war started. And we saw like the, the huge number of for those presumably supporting the war. So, and we didn't trust because we used to study depoliticization and political indifference in Russia for many years. We know that Russia is not that much politicized society. So that is why we thought that some numbers could be falsified, uh, but we decided that we have to take in-depth interview to understand what does it mean for a person to support the special military operation. So, so we realized that, yes, uh, that for, for many people, uh, support is not active. Support is maybe not, we can call support in a strict sense of the world. Then we took another wave of interviews to understand how, how this support changes over the time. I understand why Oleg didn't believe, because the, the worldwide known figures were coming from the State Research Institute. It's not falsifying the computer figures. It is just the way how they ask. You, you just need to rightly ask in, in the right form. And that's why we always have a huge difference. And unfortunately, the whole world think 80% of Russians support the war. Uh, but it never been the truth, Th that figure, even though even our figure up to 60 percent, it, it consists, later we will discuss it, it consists of very different groups inside of support. But, uh, but I'm struggling even for, for that very surface uh, measurement, like question, do you support or not? Yes, it's, it's true that uh, state-run opinion polls have basically discredited um, quantitative research methods and... Um, Actually, uh, now at this point, I think it's fair to ask you the question, is it even possible to conduct sociological research in an authoritarian regime where people might be afraid to express their opinion? And uh, how are you able to verify that, that the figures that you are getting, uh, Yelena, from your polls and that the narratives that you are gathering from your interviews, Oleg, that they actually are representative of uh, bigger clusters of society? So I'm uh, I'm absolutely confident that what we what we reporting is very close to the reality. Working uh, working with words and only in depth interviews, only qualitative research allow us to go in depth and to understand what is behind just answers to our questionnaires, to our simple questions. The difference between initial contact and final final um, collected interviews. Is, is not much worse than compared to before time, before war times. So it's very important to give opportunity, how to say, to hide, <laughs> to hide the opinion on the sensitive, on the sensitive, on the sensitive questions. And uh, one of the respondents even said that thank you very much for the opportunity not to, to discover my views. Uh, that because some, people, should, by the way, people are sometimes uh, afraid to answer the questions. What is uh, crucial, of course, formulation of the question. So they are very human and not to, to do it too formal. And when I'm listening to the real interviews, I, I hear that people do not want even to stop just un, un, after answering our questions. They want to continue this topic. When we ask uh, the person, do you support? Yes, I do support. What are you ready to do for the world? Ready for charity, for the army, or go to participate uh, in Ukraine? No, no. And uh, do you expect any good for you, any benefit for you uh, out of uh, the potential victory of Russia? No. Okay, so what does it mean, your support? So we, we really try to, to, to take a few criteria and combine uh, this group of real support and that prevents us from the wrong uh, wrong conclusions or analyzing some false data. Thank you, Elena. This is uh, super interesting. And indeed, I think uh, the question that actually really interests uh, most people in this audience is what do we actually mean by support? Um, I would like to ask Oleg about that a little bit more because you work with in-depth interviews. People actually tell you a long story, you know, and um, maybe you have um, something to say about that, you know, how do people themselves define support? The very important conclusion from our research is that active supporters are like minority, maybe 10%. 
very active opponents of the war also have to constitute my minority. So the the majority of the society is some, some somewhere in between. So there is a kind of passive support which uh, is, is not based on like political representation. When people say mm -hmm, we support those in power because they represent us, they are similar to us, we share a common values or common interests. So that is why we. Because we are accustomed to think people, many people, reflect on their own meaning of support and say something like, okay, to be honest, we uh, not only hate any wars, uh, including this one, but we also don't like very much those in power and we don't understand them. And that is why we hope that they have a reason to start the war because like, it, it is impossible to start such thing without a reason. So... But, and then they reflect on like their incompetence. Like, uh, you know, uh, what I understand very well is that I cannot understand politics well. So what I know uh, for sure definitely is that I don't know that much about politics. That is why I hope those in power who know more had the reason to start the war. Another thing is that many people, they are like very morally sensitive. That is why they cannot actively, enthusiastically support the war, because it is immoral. At the same time, they cannot become strong opponents of the war because it is too politicized for them. That is why they uh, often develop an argument that this war was inevitable. So they think of it like natural disaster. And some of them repeat Putin's arguments about like, if we would not attack Ukraine, Ukraine or, or, or NATO would attack Russia in the future. That is why very actively finding some arguments and justification in favor of this inevitable nature. People, people are now finding uh, justifications for the evil that they're witnessing. How have this reasoning, these narratives of explanation changed from the beginning of the war? and? Um, whether the support rates actually have fluctuated in any any meaningful way. During the stage, the, yes, the, the, the say war rating, let's call it in that way, was was changing. Not much, but but 30% uh, of people who are opponents to the war, uh, 10 of them, they are openly answering our question, which I mentioned, I do not support. But uh, there are other 20% which, which do not uh, answer this question, but they uh, answer in other questions exactly according to the profile of opponents. So we think that they are a hidden part of, of, of um, uh, refusal of the war. I think this is what actually a lot of people are interested in knowing, you know, because Russians are observing uh, not only military crimes that Russian army is uh, um, committing in the territory of Ukraine. It doesn't they don't only observe all these horrors that are happening over there? And because they can all call them, you know, this is a fake, this is all staged, like these photographs have been taken in the studio. We don't believe all that. All right, but people are actually observing the absolute failure of Russian commandments to actually provide for their own soldiers. They are observing severe losses, they are observing you know, absolutely inhuman treatment of uh, Russian troops by the Russian government, and yet. Uh, the support remains rather stable. How is that possible? Uh, uh, it is not just one direction uh, process. Uh, our, I, I would say that, that I am very impressed by, by, by Russian propaganda. I think that it's, it's very highly professional, intensive work. They're doing a, a, a very um, effective job. Uh, they created tonal thinking and whatever information you see, I, we were thinking, what could influence the, the war perception? As soon as people will see the truth, when when they start to use VPN, when they when more more men on the war, more more killed, uh, any any objective facts, it, it does not work because they re re rationalize it in a way which does not disturb their world picture, their the the picture which was created for for a long time. The more losses we will have uh, during during the next month, or so it could be two two uh, opposite process. One process that people would feel uh, really uh, damages and losses, and they understand that, that the war is bringing only evil, nothing, nothing, nothing good, nothing benefit, and uh, they will consider how how long we have to keep it. 
Yeah, uh, on the other side, oh, I, I anticipate the, the second wave of, of consolidation, consolidation under shelling. Special research in, in border regions shows that where we have Belgorod, Kursk, and, and Bransk, uh, they demonstrate higher figures of support. And those who are along the border and already felt all this destructions and, and civilian uh, injury or deaths, you see, they, they are more supportive to war. Well, that's and probably because they, they feel even more reconfirmed in their feeling that their country needs to be, uh, needs to be protected. Uh, when I spoke about people actually, you know, encountering facts about um, um, consequences of the war for their own relatives, for those who are in the army, for those who are maybe, um, you know, losing jobs. Do people actually really observe those effects? Do they have a chance to see the reality? We interviewed many people twice, so the first time in spring and in autumn, and we saw that people do, don't change their position dramatically. There are no protesters who became opponents of the war. There, there are no opponents who became uh, supporters of the war. However, within the same position, people can change like their attitudes, like to be more radical or more moderate. Of course, these changes are caused by some difficulties they face. What our research shows, so, so that you never know how exactly difficulties they face will change their mind. Many people continue supporting the war because they feel that this social solidarity, which is needed when you have problems, conformism, can be caused by this um, desire to preserve solidarity. You never know how exactly these troubles will impact people's minds. So this, this is what, 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 what we uh, understood doing our research. The respondents which uh, family members are at, uh, at war or have been participating in, in the war, um, they, they have a shift to, in supporting the war. And uh, we have the question how people um, uh, perceive those who try to avoid the army and uh, more people uh, uh, feel sympathy to them, but very high figure, like 40% who really uh, criticize them and think that they, 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 they place it. It's, it's a civil duty to be in the army now. Well, it's a civil duty and a gender role. You know, there, there yeah. are a lot of questions. Gender role, about... yes. It's demonstration that, that you are real men. Once people uh, lose somebody in war directly, when they actually suffer those losses, if the direct experience, um, they are actually, you know, they may radicalize and, uh, you know, actually really pine for victory. But I wonder what do people imagine as victory? People do not understand for what reason the war started. So that is why, of course, they don't have any um, clear image of victory because uh, the elites, they articulate uh, very different goals, like to, preserve, to save Donbass people, to defeat NATO, to, 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 de to defend Russia. Uh, concerning the, the, the concept of victory, you can see how different the elite and, 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 and ordinary people, because for Putin, with his cult of victory, this war is somehow uh, the repetition of uh, uh, Second World, World, World War. People, many people say like, okay, in the beginning, like we, we, we believe that uh, Putin made a big mistake and even crime uh, when he started the, the war. But now when conflict intensified, we must win. But saying we must win, they mean that we cannot be defeated because it is too dangerous. And of course, many uh, of people, they somehow are sensitive to status uh, Russia has or has to have globally. And they think, many of, of them think that um, if Russia will lose, it uh, will lost its uh, influence and its respect. So, and they can be treated, can be treated badly by, by, by other people. Yeah, this is, this is a very important distinction to make indeed, the fear of defeat and the desire for victory. Um, I have my last question to you. I'm going to put you in, in an uncomfortable position, both of you. So imagine you are in Moscow taking a Yandex taxi across the city. 
And throughout the whole 45 minute drive through traffic jams, your driver has been monologizing about the horrible West, which has provoked Russia into this war. And that, of course, he, the driver of this car, actually hates the war and he doesn't wish for women and children to be dying in shellings. But man, they were asking for it. And really, Russia was left with no choice. And whether you want it or not, there is just no other way but to support the special military operation and just to go on until it's until to the bitter end. Now you're almost at your destination. You have 60 seconds left to answer something. What will you say? Uh, with, I would say that with, with your level of loyalty and acceptance of everything from, from the power, from the government, from the, all these upper decisions, you, you will be, for sure, that you will be uh, killing, you will be killed killer. So I, I would, I would, that, that, that is the, the worst and most frightened consequences of the war, I, I believe. And it works, the fear works. Yes, the real fear is the, the, the real frightening, really works. Thank you. This must be pretty scary for a taxi driver. Yes, that's what I would try to do, to scare him. Unpleasant news. <laughs> Alek, what will you say? So I would say, think about consequences that already happened because of the war and that will happen and which, which are not good. So I think for, for Russia, for, for himself, for, for his family, for, for, his, for his country. Because infinite war is like, is, 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 a, is a infinite war without clear reasons and, and uh, uh, goals means like uh, living without future. Thank you. Very much for everyone who has been with us. Uh, thanks a lot um, to our wonderful participants, uh, Alek, Yelena. It's been great to have you here, and um, I very much hope we will see you again here um, in the live discussions with Open Democracy, or uh, as our authors, our interviewees for um, our web platform. Please follow our newsletter, uh, go visit our website, subscribe to our Telegram channel, and we'll see you again. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everybody. Well, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode and you're not yet subscribed, please do hit that follow button. Also, if you're listening on an Apple device, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does help us drive up the profile of the show. As always, don't forget to head to opendemocracy.net so that you can find out more about the topics of today's live discussion. Also, if you're particularly interested in Russia and the former Soviet states, then I really do recommend checking out the ODR newsletter. You can subscribe to that also over opendemocracy.net. And finally, just a plug for all of our social channels as well. We're on all the major social platforms. So search for Open Democracy and give us a follow on there as well. Well, once again, thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a great day. You've been listening to a podcast supported by Open Democracy. If you liked it, please consider making a small donation to help us do more. As a small media organisation, Open Democracy relies on the backing of people like you to keep going. Go to opendemocracy.net now to support our work. And one more thing, to avoid missing out on future episodes, don't forget to subscribe to this show in your favourite podcast app.